I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Grace and peace be unto you this morning. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you as we gather in the name of your son, Jesus. We already recognize that you are in the midst. Now God, breathe on the words that we're about to speak. Let them become words of life to the hearer. Save a lost soul, heal a sick body, bring peace to a troubled mind. Whatever we need, we know that God, you have it provided and make a way. Let us walk out of here more encouraged than when we came. We ask it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Amen. Uh, I've been talking to you about being stable in unstable times. And we've been dealing with uh, a bunch of scriptures, but I want to share some personal things with you today. But I also want to let you know how important it is, as always, that the word of God should be adhered to more than anything else in our lives. And oftentimes we get what is called the news mixed up with what is good news. I was sharing with someone the other day growing up, we knew what time the news would come on. We only had the evening news. And, and back in those days, uh, Walter Cronkite was the man. And Walter would come on and say, and now the news. And he would give us what they believed was relevant and important. And then he would say, and that's the way it was on February the 27th, whatever. We didn't have entertainment tonight. We didn't have gossip and reality TV. We just didn't have it. Matter of fact, we didn't have a lot of things. We didn't have any black folks on commercials. We didn't have no interracial couples on commercials. We didn't have a lot of things that have so wonderfully evolved into what is representative of our nation today. But what we have found is that we've been inundated with so many voices, so many opinions, so much so we can, we struggle with, between what's true and what's a lie. And we've been forced by society to take sides. We're divided because we're not speaking as a nation with one voice. There was a time in this country that you would never would have imagined that someone could freely burn the American flag. There was never a time in this country that you would think that people would not stand for the national anthem. There was a time in this country where uh, abortion was something that people appalled and thought was criminal. There was a time in this nation when parents were more responsible and children couldn't sue their parents and take their parents to court because they didn't feel like they were good parents because they couldn't have their way. So many things that just absolutely boggles the mind in such a short period of time. There was no 911. We didn't have push button phones. You couldn't sneak a call because if you called someone, you would get caught with the rotary dial. If they didn't catch you going oh, dialing, it would catch you coming back. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And uh, the, the phones were so heavy that the conversations were pretty short. We lived in neighborhoods where neighbors were concerned about other neighbors. People watched out for other people's children. Respect was something that was high on the list of family honor. You, you, you got whooped quicker over being disrespectful and, and bringing that and stealing. That stealing in line just about got you to the grave. And uh, you, you, you didn't just hang out at other people's house. You came home at a certain time. You, you, you couldn't just eat at somebody's house because you wanted to. You, 
They would say, call your parents and let them know where you are. Now children convince other parents, I don't, I don't like my parents. Don't tell them I'm over here. So you couldn't get away with that when I was growing up. Because they want to whip you and call your parents and tell them everything you said. We weren't beating up the teachers and we weren't screwing them. Matter of fact, every teacher I had, you wouldn't even think of that. You would be like, are you kidding me? I'd be ruined for life. So many things. I know you're saying, boy, pastor's back. I'm back. I've never left. Why am I saying this? I'm talking about the importance of what we hear and the importance of how we process what we hear. And the most important thing that we can process based on what we hear is the word of God. The Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away. Believe me, I don't know quite how that's going to look. I don't know how that's going to happen. But I do know that it's real because the, too much of the word has already proven itself to be real. But the word of God shall stand forever. Thy word, O oh God, is settled in heaven. So I just want to bring a few scriptures before we go back to the text I was dealing with on last time. I was thinking about it, and I, I, I want to establish something. Over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, I'm, I'm going to read the Amplified and the Message version of the text. See to it that no man takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, pseudo-intellectual babble, according to the tradition and musings of mere men following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. Do you know today it is more acceptable to be philosophical, to be impressive, to use words that somehow put you up and others down? Words that you have to accept it for what you think it is, but because you may have a limited vocabulary, you don't know what the heck they're saying. People that say things and twist it so much so that because of their position, you think they have to be right. The Bible says you better not be drawn away by that nonsense, but rather following the truth, which is the teachings of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Message Bible says, watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. That's what's happening today. They have so many commercials, so many things about medication, so many things about how to disguise your immoral behavior, how to take things to allow you to continue being immoral and filthy and depraved and full of debauchery, uh, but it, 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 it's not dealing with the root cause, it's just dealing with the symptoms. And, and we're like, oh, I got to get that. I don't want to change my behavior. I just don't want to die because of my behavior, so maybe this will prolong my death, but I'm going to continue my behavior. Are you all in the church today? They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. It's amazing how today people dazzle you with words. The governor of New York is in trouble. He was dazzling people with words when it seemed and appeared to be he was the golden boy during the early days of the pandemic of how he was handling things in the great state of New York. I only call it the great state because it is and it is my home state and it is the Empire State. Glory to God. And, 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 and see, when you, they used to have a saying, those that live in glass houses don't throw stones. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. You'd be surprised how many believers are reading the horoscope. See, it's getting quiet now. How many people have gone on to the internet and downloaded? There's an app. Somebody was telling me 
that can read your palm and tell you how long you're going to live or die. I don't want to read that. Because if one of my lines is short, I, I, I'm going to walk around having a problem. I don't know how you interpret that. I've never done it. But I mean, I have a good friend. He, he, he uh, takes me around when I'm on the mainland. He's from Morocco. And he's full African. And he did this uh, ancestry thing. And, and I told him, I said, why do you do this? Well, I just want to know. He says, I know my father and my grandparents. We're all from Africa. I just wanted to confirm whatever. And I said, okay. So he gets this report back. And he's so much African, so much something else. So, so, oh, he is upset. He is so upset just before Christmas. So back around October, September, I said, I feel like you're going to get a Christmas surprise. They send him an update. Now, this, this is him now. He says, oh, he said, I'm really mad now. I said, what? He said, they said I'm part Nigerian. I am not part Nigerian. Now, in case you don't realize it, there's a lot of people that don't want to be associated with Nigerians for whatever reason. I will not elaborate. I've heard many things, but I'm not here to put down anyone. I'm just saying that that would be like some people wouldn't want to know that they were from a certain cultural group. Huh? They might not say nothing. If, if you black as the ace of spade and they came back and said you was 80% Norwegian, you'd be like, what, what? Give me my money back. <laughs> keep, keep, keep moving, Reverend. Second, Second Thessalonians. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere today. Chapter 3, verse 6 says this. Now we command you, believers. Listen to this. Now we command you, believers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, that you withdraw and keep away from every brother or sister who leads an undisciplined life and does not live in accordance with the traditions and the teachings that you've received. Wow. I got not one amen. We command you, we believers, in the name, by the authority of Jesus, to withdraw and keep away from every brother or sister who leads an undisciplined life or does not live in accordance with the traditions and the teachings. Well, we'd have to really find some new friends now, don't we? The Message Bible says this. Our orders, backed up by the Master, Jesus, are to refuse to have anything to do with those among you who are lazy and refuse to work the way we were taught. In the church, people do what the heck they want to do and not what they've been taught. Do what they feel and not what they're taught. Get upset when they get corrected. Don't admit they were wrong. Felt like I well, we've been doing it that no, you've been doing it like that, and you've been told not to do it like that. There's a problem. This ministry and other ministries can't go forward, and it's not the pandemic, it's you not doing what you're supposed to do with the right attitude in which you're supposed to do it. Being where you're supposed to be on time with the right attitude, with the right spirit, lifting up Jesus and not you. We don't want to hear about your circumstances when it's time to do the work. Don't permit them to freeload on the rest. We showed you how to pull your weight when we were with you, so get on with it. We didn't sit around on our hands expecting others to take care of us. In fact, we worked our fingers to the bone up half the night, moonlighting so you wouldn't be burdened with taking care of us. That's what Paul was saying. I didn't become a burden on you, but I had a life and an example to live to show you how it ought to be done. The word of God should be your rule for life. You don't do it because I'm looking or someone else is looking. It's because God is looking. 
You shouldn't do it because I was talking to a brother. He said, Pastor, I need prayer. I said, why? He said, my kid came home and needed help with math. So I showed them how to, how to do it. Teacher called me in and said, you're not teaching your kid math right. And he said, well, what am I doing wrong? He said, well, you're teaching your kid to do it like this, and we're teaching them to do it like this. He said, well, the answer is the same. <laughs> uh, we're not looking at the answer. We're looking at how you arrive at it. He said, well, I'm, 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 I'm really having a problem here. He said, because I'm, you know, it's hard for me to help my kid because we're on two different wavelengths here. That's exactly right. We don't want you helping your kid. Ah, time to get out of that school. When you tell a parent that they're uh, not important and that their voice has somehow been diminished because somehow you've raised yourself higher than the authority of this kid, there's a problem. Shall we go to another scripture? James chapter 1, verse 22. The Amplified Version says this. But prove yourselves doers of the word. Remember I said, seek to improve yourself and not prove yourself? But prove yourselves doers of the word actively and continually, actively and continually, actively and continually obeying God's precepts and not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meaning, deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning contrary to the truth. Boy, this is preaching right here and continually obeying God's precepts. Not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meaning. The Message Bible says, don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you're anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. Why have I brought these scriptures out? Because it takes us back to where we were when we last gathered. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 26. Jesus says, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Everyone that hears these words of mine, hears them and acts upon them, will be likened or will be like a wise man, a far-sighted, practical, and sensible man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Hmm. The message Bible says, these words I speak unto you are not incidental additions to your life. Homeowner improvements to standard, to your standard of living. They are foundational words. Words to build a life on. The word of God are foundational words to build a life on, character on, integrity on, morality on, huh? relationships on, a marriage on, friendship on. Do you hear what I'm saying today?
The Bible says if you work these words into your life that I speak, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. I'm going to give you a personal story. My dad was born in 1928. My dad was born, and as a young child, they found out he was a type 1 diabetic. Back in those days, that was not good. Because at an early age, before he was a teenager, he was taking insulin. Back in those days, they were very poor, but he had to have a special kind of diet, had to eat a certain kind of way. And when you had a large family that they came from, they had to give special attention to him because he had medical needs. And I asked him one day, because my father would get up in the morning since we knew him, took a needle, ate his breakfast, took his lunch, came home and had his dinner. I watched with great uh, intensity how he lived his life to the point I got super curious. I would watch him go to the ice box and open up the ice cream container and put a spoon in, take one I'd be a scoop of ice cream, not a scoop, spoon, put it in his mouth and put the ice cream back. I'm like, uh-uh. How, how do you do that? <laughs> I could see him, watch him say no to certain things that I wanted extra. One time in church, the church I was raised in, we never went long. We was, we was pretty cut and dry. And depending on what season it was, you better be cut and dry. Folks would be cutting out. And uh, a lot of sports enthusiasts, and they just, Reverend, you can go, you can talk about how you, God raised you up all you want. He raised me up out of this seat when, when, it, when it's time for that game to come on. And uh, one Sunday, it wasn't sports season, but my father was a deacon in the church, and the service had gone, was going a little bit longer. So he got up and left. So one of the real religious deacons, one of the Sanhedrin went to the pastor and said, you know, Deacon Anderson every now and then leaves service before the benediction. And uh, I believe he needs to be addressed because something is not right. The same deacon who lived on our street also mentioned to the pastor as a side note. I, I've noticed that the deacon sometime comes home late from work and there are times his car never shows up. I uh, uh, think we need to have a, a, a conversation for the good of the ministry. So the pastor called my father and he went to the church and this deacon was there, laid out his claims. My father was absolutely stunned. He says, where are these allegations coming from? He says, first of all, I don't wear my, my disability on my shoulder my disease or whatever you want to call it, but I am a diabetic. And when you all decide to play church beyond the time that church is supposed to be, rather than sit here and have a diabetic something go wrong, I know when it's time to eat. I know when my sugar level is not what it should be. They didn't have the machines and stuff they have today, but he had it long enough to know you got to go get something to eat. That's why I left church. Well, uh, 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 what, what about this, uh, you know, coming home late and uh, what? Well, the deacon here says sometimes you don't come home to 
wee hours in the morning. I thought it's the wait a minute. I'm home every night at 6 o'clock, which is really none of your doggone business. Now, my father was a deacon, but he could cuss. Where do you think I learned all this stuff about what people do in church? He was hot now. He said, damn it, I got a garage. <laughs> that goes into the house. That's why you don't see my car out front. Is there anything else? That's a side note to where I'm going. So I kept watching my dad. So one day I sat him down. I said, let me ask you a question. We didn't have a lot of conversation. He wasn't that kind of person. So I don't know why, but he wasn't. I said, Dad, I got to ask you this one question that bothers me. How is it that you can take eight or nine peanuts and put it in the cup and eat it? A spoon of ice cream and eat it. Every plate had vegetables and meat, but it was like portioned out. He said, let me tell you what happened. I would watch this. As a boy, I was in school. I never told anyone anything about my condition because it wasn't any of their business. It wasn't their life. It was my life. So one day, one kid figured out he must be one of those diabetes, diabetics. And you know how kids try to say stuff. And my dad was, was denying it. They said, if you're not a diabetic, eat, these, eat this chocolate. Everybody eating it. Come on, how come you're not eating it? He said, well, I don't care for any. Uh-huh. You can't eat it because you got a disease. You know how kids are mean and how kids can get... get, get see, y'all sitting there like, I, I don't know what you... Huh? That's how some of you all lost your virginity. Some of y'all went on drugs. People dare you. Don't look at me like that. Peer pressure is what it's called. He took the candy and ate it and went into a type of diabetic shock. He said, the doctor sat me down and looked me in my face and he said, Ernest, I have a couple questions for you. Do you want to live or die? He says, I want to live. He says, do you want to have children and possibly grandchildren? Yes. He said, don't you ever again in life allow me, your mama, your daddy, your brother, your anybody push you to do what you did today or you'll be dead. Do you hear me? Now repeat what I just said. Repeat it again. Repeat it again. Listen to this. My father said he walked away from that doctor fortified and strengthened. You know why? He got a dose of truth. He got it to where it was more than just listening to a doctor say he heard it. He processed it. Now, let me tell you a most amazing fact about this. Medically, my father, life expectancy was 40 years old at the time he had this particular disease and the knowledge that they knew about it. We never said our dad had a disease because to us, he'd been doing that since we known him. So we just figured that's just life. Huh? Come on. If you have a fat sister, you don't go around to our, oh, we, we got four sisters, but one of them's fat. You don't say that. You got a crazy brother. Now, unless, unless it comes up and somebody says, you know, we got a crazy brother. Then you got to, somebody just opened the gate for you to say, yeah, we got one too. <laughs> All right. So, my father lived 20, almost 30 years beyond the 40 years of life expectancy. Why? Because he heard the truth. He heard the truth about his situation, about his condition. Didn't deny it. Didn't rebuke. I rebuke that. You know how y'all do? 
it's time that we get real. You've heard the truth. You heard you shouldn't shack. You heard you shouldn't. You heard you shouldn't commit adultery. Heard you shouldn't fornicate. Heard you shouldn't do drugs. Heard you shouldn't hurt it, hurt it, hurt it, hurt it. But didn't you make a decision? I've grown and I do what I want. Then the consequences, somebody say, can be devastating. So one day my father got ill. I happened to call home in New York because something, the Holy Spirit said, call your mother. I called my mother and she was in tears. I said, what's going on? So they're taking your father to the hospital in the ambulance. That, those words right there, let me know it's critical. My dad never going to go anywhere in no ambulance. I fly to New York. He has to have heart surgery. He comes through the surgery, triple bypass surgery. And then everything starts to shut down. I will never forget this. I'm at the Presbyterian Hospital walking down to my father's room and I passed the day room and there was a woman in there, just one woman. She had a newspaper and it was shaking like this and it was upside down. God said, go tell that woman that her mother's going to live and not die. I go in, I said, ma'am, I, 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 I said, you're obviously a believer. She said, oh, yes, I pray, we believe in God. I said, well, God just told me in the hallway to tell you that you might not know. I never knew her. I didn't know who was using the hospital to see. I said, he said, your mother's going to live and I die. I fell on the floor. Bam. I oh, thank you, Jesus. So I, I'm walking out in power now. Pop's going to make it for real. I go in, pray with him, pray for him. They got him all hooked up. My mom's, every, everybody's all, you know, concerned because, but, 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 but encouraged because he came through the surgery. When I walked out of the room going back to my car to go back to the hotel, God said, your father's going to die. I, I could have I passed out right then. I said, now what is this? How can this be? How can this be when I, some woman I don't even know? Maybe those words weren't for her. I know some of y'all like, what? Jesus. <laughs> so Dr. McCoy called me and he asked me how things were going. I said, Doc, it's not, it's not looking good. There's one thing. I, now, I thank God for Dr. McCoy. I thank God for all of you. But you know what? Every ministry that has a professional in it like him is blessed, especially if you recognize his gifts. You know, we don't. If you if you have a gift or a talent in this church and it's not your gift is not above your God calling, you know, I'm I'm this, I'm that. No, no. You never heard Dr. McCord go around saying that. Right? But he's willing to help anybody. He he's got he's got information. If he doesn't have it, he'll come back and tell you. He'll give you guidance. He'll tell you what to ask the doctor. Can I get a witness? I tell people. I may be Apostle Paul to him, but he's Dr. Luke to me. And he called me up and he said something that was eye-opening. Once he spoke this truth to me, it absolutely helped me. It was simple, but I had been blocked from it. Everyone that hears these sayings of mine, heareth it and doeth it is likened unto a wise man. He said, Pastor, I want to share something with you. He said, yes, your father came through the surgery, and I understand things are not going well. He said, but I just want to give you this piece of information. And I said, okay, Doc. He said, for over 60 years or so, your father, his lungs had diabetes, his liver had diabetes, his kidney had diabetes. Every part of his body was diseased. So when he had heart surgery, like with anybody, you need every organ in your body to kick in. And his, body, his organs had been so diseased for so long, they could kick, but they couldn't kick in. Good God Almighty. And I stopped and thought about the goodness of God. Man should have been dead at 40. He is knocking on the door to 70. No blindness, no amputation, no issue. God kept them. Not only did he have 
children, but he had grandchildren and had a great grandchild on the way. Because when you hear the word, no matter if he speaks it through a doctor, if he speaks it through a teacher, if he speaks it through a kid, when God sends a word and you hear it and you do it, he will liken you unto a wise man that built his house on the rock. If he'd have been a sandy Christian, if he'd have built on the sand and said, I'm going to try to live on both sides of the street, I'm going to try to do it both ways, he would have been dead. Are you listening to me this morning? Are you building on a rock? Are you building on truth? Are you building on imagination and fakery? Man told me something. He says, well, people have to keep dreaming. I said, I'm going to tell you something right now. I said, I believe in dreams, but when you dream, you're usually sleep. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And, 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 and oh, Lord have mercy. It, 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 hey, you know, a dream is good if you get it. But when you wake up, you ought to do something with that that you dream. you building your life you've been told something you've been given something that may not be pretty you may have inherited something that you didn't ask for I'll be built at <coughs> I don't have that that's none of me well here's the truth do something about it do something about it. When the doctors told me of my neurological condition, it said there's nothing we can do for you. You think that's pretty? How many of you like to go to a doctor and they tell you something like that? Not one person. Well, what, what do I look out for? What, you know, we can't even tell you what because it's different for everybody. But that's even more encouraging. But just know that you got it. And so I started noticing things as I got older. And I went back to the doctor. He said, oh, we forgot to tell you. The older you get, this condition tries to, it, it appears to escalate. I'm like, well, that's fine to know. I would have probably stopped the, the aging process. <laughs> but there's some things I can do to modify, to make things better. But see, people look at you and they go, oh, I wonder what's wrong with him. I wonder what's wrong with her. See, you got to stop that because some people will give in to something instead of dealing with it. The truth is the truth. Do I pray and believe God? That's probably why it hasn't gotten as bad as it could. Doctor said, you ought to be grateful and thankful because I can show you some pictures that will just make you cry. I said, don't show me anything. I want to keep my picture in front of me. I want to be the poster boy for this thing. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to close. Because if I go too much longer, you'll forget the emphasis of what I wanted to say today. If you build on the rock, you got to understand God's sayings comes through many different people. When, when Moses was leading, ruling, and reigning, his father-in-law came and said, now, that's all good. I honor you in your position. But I do not like the way you treat my daughter. You might say, I don't find that in the Bible. Well, it's in there. It's implied. He said, now, you need to ease up on all this, what you're doing. And, and give some of this authority to other people and pay attention to your wife and your family. That's God speaking. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes, it, the, some, you know what really will get you? Somebody you don't like, and God gives, uses them to tell you something. <laughs> you ever had that happen? I know God ain't told you, yo, demonic. You get your lying self out of here. Why ain't God tell you something about you? Get, oh, go, get out of here. <laughs> the problem is, I've had people tell me what the kids told them. Said, didn't you hear pastor say something? Son? They said they had the, their mouth dropped open. They couldn't say anything. Because God was using his words to tell them what they already knew. But they weren't doing it. You going to whoop a child for that?
Let me tell you when they said they was going to whip the child. I'm going to tell pastor what y'all said. If you go near that pastor, I'm going to, oh, you will regret the day. He said, oh, I don't think that's right. <laughs> I told him after with all this, I said, son, all that live God be must suffer persecution. <laughs> Isn't that the book? So listen to me today. I wanted to bring this so clear. Because I thought about that example of my dad. I wouldn't be here if he had disobeyed the word that God used through that medical doctor. The people at the church was trying to find fault because they didn't know what was the cause of him leaving early or doing this or doing that. Because people are always watching you, more so today. You can't go anywhere if people taking pictures and then misrepresenting you, misinterpreting what they think they saw. Because they got nothing else better to do. Going on the internet, checking on people. Won't you live your own life? Good God. But just won't you leave people alone? I don't care. If you got $10 million, I don't care. If you got 50 cents, I don't care about that. If you're happy and you're living your life, I'm glad about that. If you're doing what he called you to do, I'm glad about that. So today, as you seek to improve yourself, instead of proving yourself, make sure that what you're standing on is solid. Make sure it's proven ground. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. The words of that doctor saved my father's life because they were words of life, they were words of wisdom, they were words of truth. And you shall know the truth. If you hear these sayings of mine and do it, then I will liken you unto a man that built his house upon a rock. And let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise.